Uh, so good morning, everyone. I wasn't sure if anyone would show up at 10 in the morning, but you're here, so I'm very happy. Um, so there was there is a story about building the Tower of Babel. Uh, when the people built the Tower of Babel, they built this really impressive tower here. Uh, in the beginning, they all had one language. They all spoke the same language. They all understood what each other was saying. Uh, and, as, and because people are people, they become, became very braggy. So someone took away their language, and they didn't have a common language anymore. And the tower never got finished. In my experience, a lot of software projects start out uh, with people speaking different languages. Not in, this, uh, in the sense of human languages, but in the sense of jargon. So, for example, you might have someone who's talking about tables. This person might be a database administrator, for example. Um, and tables uh, have, their own, uh, have their own vocabulary, they have their own words to describe things. And then you have a programmer, and the programmer, she might speak about space shuttles, space shuttle classes, and astronaut classes, and inheritance, and stuff like that. And this is an entirely different vocabulary than the vocabulary used by the person talking about the tables. And then you have the third person who's talking about the problem at hand, the domain expert, that wants to uh, solve a, a, a problem. In our example, this is because space is cool, uh, astronauts and space shuttles. So this person doesn't really understand what tables are or what classes are or what inheritance is, uh, other than in the human context, maybe. Um, so um, they all speak a different language. And we are often in this uh, situation. In your project, this might be the designers that speak a different language than the programmers. Um, but yeah, I think those three areas are uh, very common in projects. So this prob problem was a problem that uh, Eric Evans saw uh, when he wrote his book about domain-driven design. Uh, in a talk I gave uh, recently, people saw that my name is Eric Evans, but it's not. But that would be nice, then I would have written a really great book, but I'm not. So this is not mine. <laughs> so um, domain-driven design is the, the simple idea that um, when we find an ubiquitous language, we can uh, solve a lot of pro problems. So if ev everyone on the team understands the words that each other is using, then we reduce the number of misunderstandings. Um, on, and um, if you have the, the programmer, the database administrator, and the domain expert, if they understand um, what, what the, the words mean, then um, they can uh, solve problems together instead of trying to explain to each other their words and stuff like that. Uh, and because it's domain driven, the language is not from the technical perspective, uh, it is from the domain. So if we're talking about space shuttles, in astronauts, then those are the words we are using. And we're not using classes or tables or stuff like that. Uh, so this is the, the basic uh, idea. Um, Domain-driven design uh, has two uh, important uh, things that have to be there before you can implement it. The first one is iterative development. That means that you are not um, making waterfall or something like that. You are uh, building in iterations. So you are getting a uh, very uh, um, get, getting a feedback loop, uh, ex especially with the domain experts or with your, your customers uh, or, or people like that. So this is very important. I think a lot of people already have implemented that. Uh, I, I hope that no one here uh, does waterfall. If you are doing that, then we can talk later. <laughs> but um, I think it's fair to assume that a lot of people do that uh, in one way or another. And the other uh, thing that is very important is a close relationship between the developers uh, the, uh, and the domain experts. Because if you don't talk to each other, then you cannot build a language together. That's not possible. Um, you need to talk to each other. Um, otherwise, you, yeah, that's, that's, that will be a problem. So my name is Lucas. I'm not from this beautiful beach. Uh, I'm from a cold city called Cologne. Um, most people here will be familiar with that. Uh, at this point, I usually make jokes about Germany. I think they won't fly as well uh, with the German audience, so I will skip those. Uh, I work for a company called ArangoDB GmbH, um, and we build something called ArangoDB. Um, it is an open source NoSQL database. And this raises two questions. What is open source? I think most people here are aware what it is, because it's an open source conference. So the second question is, what is NoSQL? 
Um, and this is a surprisingly hard question to answer, in my experience. Because I'm doing NoSQL for some time now, and I'm still not sure what the answer is. So um, let's try to find out. So if we have uh, this well-known bubble of SQL, this, those are all the databases that use SQL. And obviously, NoSQL are all the databases that are not in this bubble, right? So uh, this would mean that Git is maybe NoSQL. I don't know. Maybe uh, yeah, MongoDB might be NoSQL, uh, Neo4j, things like that. Oh, uh, Couchbase, I heard, is also NoSQL. <laughs> so, um, and this is maybe OK. Maybe we can try to gra grab what that means. But then people try to make it more complicated by saying that NoSQL means not only SQL. So now we have this weird thing going on where maybe everything is NoSQL. So um, Postgres, some people say Postgres is now also a NoSQL database. I don't know if that's true because I don't know what NoSQL means. But um, let's try to find out. So you might uh, first ask, what is NoSQL? Um, then uh, you might <coughs> get the answer, it's not SQL. And that raises the question, what is SQL anyway? Um, and uh, SQL, I think a lot of people forget that, uh, is a relational algebra. And <coughs> because we hide it behind so many abstractions, we tend to forget what, what, what SQL is and what SQL means. Um, and a relational algebra is an algebra on relations. Um, that seems obvious, but this raises two questions. What is an algebra and what is a relation? But let's talk about the relation because it's, this is not a mathematics lecture. So a relation is basically this. Uh, a relation is a set of tuples. Uh, a set of tuples where every single tuple has the same number of elements. So in this uh, uh, case, those are three tuples. Uh, we have one part where there is uh, a name. Alice, uh, and in the other case, Bob. Then we have some weird string, uh, because we are mostly programmers here, I guess. Um, this seems to be a date. <laughs> and then we have some weird number. And this is one of the problems with this uh, way of looking at it, because we don't know what those fields are. Is what, what is the state? What does it stand for? Um, and what does the number mean? It could mean anything. So. Uh, people came up with a quite clever idea on how to make that easier to understand. And this is uh, putting those uh, tuples into tables. So if we put it into a table and we give each of those uh, uh, rows a nice heading, then we can understand more, uh, more easily what that means. So in this case, we say the first field, that is the name of the person. The second one is the birthday. And the third one is the city. But this, again, is weird um, if you are not a programmer. Uh, because why is the city a number? A city is not a number. Uh, does, th this doesn't make any sense. Most of you will know why, probably why that is a number. But if you uh, if you are in a uh, are talking to someone who's not programming, who has not yet implemented a web application with MVC and stuff like that, then this might be weird. Um, and if you try to explain it to people, then you might see that there is a certain disconnect between those two vocabulary roles. So let's say we have Alice, and Alice owns a spaceship. Then uh, this is the, the drawing that our uh, domain expert is drawing on, on a piece of paper. Here, this is Alice, and she owns this space shuttle. And then the do uh, database professional sits down and says, of course, we need three tables. And the person's like, what? <laughs> I don't understand what you, are, what, what you are talking about. And you, are all, you all know why that is. Because you know that we need somewhere to, put, uh, to store the people. We not need somewhere to, uh, uh, to store the space shuttles or uh, spaceships in general. And then we need some join table to, to see the relationship between those two things. But be aware that somewhere in, the, in our team, there is a translation going on. Probably it's in the head of someone in the team. But there is a translation process. And because I'm not a native English speaker and speak a lot of English, I know that in translation, we lose a lot of stuff. Even if we understand the language quite well, we still lose some information along the way. Uh, and you probably have experienced that as well. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, coffee delivery. Uh, thank you. 
Um, so if, uh, keep this in mind uh, for the next few steps. This is very important. But first, let's talk about the domain side. So in Eric Evans' book, uh, he talks about six main components that we will have in our, uh, in our domain world. Um, six different kinds of objects. So the first three are entity, value, object, and service. So an entity is something that has an, uh, is, is identified by an ID. So it is something that it has its own identity. Uh, let's say a person is an entity, because if we change something about a person, like the last name, the person will still be the same person. Uh, so uh, if a person gets married and we change the last name, then we will still, we will still want to say, okay, this is the same person. The, the, the other uh, uh, information about this per person is still relevant and still uh, real. So we have to find some other way to identify the person and not just take uh, all the fields that describe this person because then as soon as we change the name, we will have a different person. Also, this means that if we have two uh, to data sets where um, all values are the same, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have, uh, have the same uh, object. So, uh, object, <laughs> person, maybe. Um, so, for example, if our, all we store in our database about a person is the first name and last name, then there might be two people that have the, first, the same first name and last name, but they are still not the same person. We don't want to associate everything that is associated with the one person with the, uh, um, with the other one. Uh, this is entirely different in a value object. A value object is only identified by its value. So if we have a street, for ex uh, an address, for example, then this address might, contain, uh, might consist of the street, the street number, the, uh, the postal code, for example. Um, and if two value objects uh, have the same street number, uh, the same street and the same postal code, they are the same address. There's nothing else identifying them. They are the same address. And this has one important uh, um, uh, consequence, which is the, that the person is mutable, but the value object is immutable. And this is kind of a trick, because as soon as we change something about a value object, uh, we can also just copy it and, ch uh, and change the values in the copy, because the, everything that uh, we said about the, the original version is not necessarily uh, true anymore. Uh, and this has a very important uh, consequence for modeling it in our database. So uh, when, we, uh, when we say those uh, two are, uh, one is identified by its ID and the other one by the value, and we have mutable and immutable state, there's still a third one, which is the service. And the service um, is only identified by what it does. And uh, it, in uh, his opinion, uh, uh, service should al always be stateless. So a good example for that is a mail sending service. So you have your application, and at some point you want to send out mails. Then uh, this probably should not have a state, because if you, want, if you send the same information to this uh, component, then you want to have the same effect uh, resulting from that. Uh, so we only identify it by what, what it does. And we say we don't have any state. We don't have to th think about mutability or immutability at this point. Um, OK, so those three are the main categories. Is this clear to everyone? OK, nobody is shaking their head. OK, good. Uh, so there are three more. Uh, and those are quite well known for programmers uh, because um, there are patterns that we use a lot. Uh, the first one is the factory. Um, the factory is something uh, is a uh, is a domain uh, object that builds other domain objects. So, for example, we have a very complicated uh, procedure to create a person. Then we might not want to make that the responsibility of the person itself, but we want to have a, a, a outer thing that builds it, that constructs it. Uh, in some communities, like the Ruby community. Uh, the word factory is so Java-like uh, Java that people don't use it anymore and they call it a builder, but it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> so, yeah, I still call it a factory, even though I'm a Ruby programmer. Um, the second thing is the repository. And a repository is something where you can store things in, uh, in uh, where you can get things out, uh, where you can um, get a sorted result 
where you can uh, find a specific entry in, uh, in uh, this domain object. So it's a collection of other domain objects. Uh, and in a lot of cases, the repository is something that is backed by a dat database, because a database is very good at those things. But you have to understand that in the domain world, we don't know what a database is, because the database doesn't play any role in our domain world. Um, and therefore, we just say, this is something where we can store things in, we can get things out, we can uh, yeah, search for a, a certain criteria, for example. Um, and then we have the aggregate. And the aggregate is a combination of uh, entity and multiple value objects. So for example, we have our person again, and this person lives in a certain street. Um, then we have a combination of, uh, of the uh, entity person with the value object address. Uh, you could also imagine that uh, this person has more than one address because they live in more than one place. Then there might be uh, an array of um, of addresses. And this is still an aggregate. So as long as we have one root, which is a domain object, which is connected to a lot of value objects, then we are talking about an aggregate. And uh, Eric Evans, at this point, suggests denormalization. Because in his book, he talks about uh, SQL databases and not no SQL databases. Mm. He says that this is, uh, for a lot of people, denormalization is an anti-pattern. Uh, in my experience, a lot of people see that differently, but um, he says the only way we can do that is denormalization. And we can use a very important trick uh, from before, because we are saying that our value objects are immutable. We can copy them as many times as we want. So if we say that we have a person and they, uh, this person lives in an address, we can just uh, put this entire address into the person, and uh, it won't matter. Because if we change this address, uh, we don't have to change the address, all addresses of the same value. Because that would be weird. <laughs> when, we, when a person moves, then not everyone in the same house moves as well, hopefully. Um, so um, therefore, we can use denormalization in this case. But think about the case where we have a person that has more than one uh, address. Then we, can, we maybe have to introduce address one and address two underscore la, but we may, might not want to do that. Um, so this becomes ugly really fast. And we might need to take a value object and make it and give it its own uh, ID, making it an entity, uh, basically. Uh, so Eric Evans describes this as a problem, but uh, a problem that we need to face. Uh, we have, but we have another alternative to doing that. Uh, and this would be lifting certain restrictions about the way we are modeling stuff. So we could say that uh, our tuples are allowed to us, uh, contain other tuples in our relations. Um, and this would allow us to embed those addresses as an entire tuple into the person. We might also say that we allow arbitrary attributes, uh, giving this entire, uh, uh, removing this need for uh, null uh, lines and stuff like that, which I find is discussed much more uh, when people talk about NoSQL, but is much less important. Uh, I think the part where we can embed, uh, embed tuples into other tuples as an array, for example, this is much more important because we now can take those addresses and put them as an array into uh, the person. Uh, and um, we have talked about space shuttles here. So let's say we have a space shuttle, and the space shuttle consists of a lot of different parts. Then uh, we have this contains relation basically going on. So this, the parts, they are all uh, value objects, because um, there might be a lot of different uh, kinds of uh, screws and, and stuff like that. And um, if you change one of them, not all others change as well. So they are definitely value objects for us. Um, so we can treat them like that. Um, and we, if we could now say that the space sh shuttle contains the parts, and we can model that in our database, then we are mostly talking about document stores. Because document stores allow you to not model it everything as a table, but model everything as a document. So in a document, you can say um, addresses and then just assign an array of addresses. Uh, and those addresses 
should be value objects. If those are, uh, if you are embedding other um, entities, then you might run into problems because if you change an entity that is embedded into another, uh, another entity and you have to search through all your different entities in your database and uh, adjust them. So always think about, is this an entity or a value object and um, model it uh, um, uh, according to that. Uh, so in our situation now, we have uh, documents called, uh, co document with everything about Alice, we have a document with everything about the space shuttle, but we still need to model the relationship between those two things. And uh, as I uh, talked about before, we might have something like uh, a join table, or in the case of a document store, a join document maybe. Uh, I don't know if this word exists, but I made it up. Um, so we might say that Alice has some ID and the space shuttle has some ID, and now we create this uh, uh, document which has both of the IDs in there, and when we want to find out what space, uh, which space shuttle belongs to Alice, then um, we uh, might want to do something called a join. Uh, and you'll see uh, Frankenstein's monster in the background there, uh, because I'm afraid of joins. I, I admit that, <laughs> because I, um, I worked for some, quite some time uh, at university for a chair that does um, social network analysis. Uh, so um, we did a lot of joints. Uh, <laughs> and um, they were uh, scattered all through our Java code. And um, when you looked into the comments beneath and uh, uh, above, those, uh, ab above those statements, then there was a lot of cursing going on. Because a lot of people didn't understand anymore what, is, what's, what was going on, basically. <laughs> And this is a common phenomenon, because if you start out with, out with joints, they are okay, they are uh, nice, they are quite easy to understand, but they get more complicated very fast. And then you might um, uh, uh, come to a point where you are joining above multiple level, levels and you get into recursive joints, and then your brain starts to hurt very bad. Um, but I think there is an alternative to that, uh, which is modeling it as the graph that it might be, maybe is. Uh, not everything is a graph. Um, some people argue that everything is a graph. I would not agree, but um, I think in a lot of cases we see those relationships, we can see them as a graph. And one of the things wh why I see that is because people, if, if, you want, uh, if you ask a person that is not a programmer to, uh, to draw what they, are, what they are thinking of and what, what they want to have, then they often end up with something like this. So they might draw a bubble for Alice, and they might draw a bubble for the space shuttle. Um, and then they might draw some arrow uh, uh, between them and say, like, Alice owns the space shuttle. Maybe it's an arrow pointing to the space shuttle where it just says owns, for example. But something like this will happen. Uh, I tried this with a lot of different people, and this is m what most people draw. Um, so if you can model that in your database, then you're talking about a graph database. Um, people have different uh, definitions of what a graph database is. It's almost as bad as uh, people defining NoSQL. Um, but uh, I think a graph database is just some database where you can store graphs in, and then you can query them in some nice way. This is a graph database for me. This might not be the hardest definition ever, but I think it's a quite good definition which applies to all the graph databases I know. Um, so uh, now we can model those kinds of things in our database. But imagine that we still have the space shuttle which has parts. Then in a graph database, what most people will do is take those parts out and then connect them again with other edges between the, uh, the people and uh, the, between the space shuttle and their parts. And then you again created uh, an entity from your value objects, which is uh, an anti-pattern. Um, so uh, I think it's a good idea to combine those two things. So let's just say that Alice is still a document. Uh, the space shuttle is still a document. So we can do all those things I described before. Uh, we can embed stuff in them, uh, and we can, have, uh, we can leave out certain documents and stuff like that. Uh, so this is still a document. And then we do some, uh, a little trick and say that the edge is also a document. And this has a nice consequence, because we can now do all kinds of stuff with this edge. We can say that the edge has uh, an ownership uh, attribute. Um, uh, an owned since attribute, sorry. Uh, so we know that Alice owns the space shuttle since this year. Uh, and then we can do queries like, give me all the neighbors of Alice, 
which have uh, uh, an own since between 1970 and 1980. So we know all the space shuttles she uh, owned in this, uh, in this um, uh, yeah, time, sorry. Um, so if you can do both of those things, um, then you're talking about a multimodal database. And a multimodal database is just a database that combines multiple models of databases. But in my experience, most of the multimodal databases combine the document store with the graph database. And the reason for that is that they kind of uh, that this combination kind of um, uh, uh, removes the, the disadvantages that each of the other that the other kind has because uh, document store is quite bad at modeling relationships. Uh, between documents uh, and the um, uh, um, a draft database is really good at this, but it's not that good at um, modeling nested data and stuff like that. Because then you always have to go to the um, to to um, to the relations between those uh, entities and stuff like that. So if we look again at our uh, um, problem at the beginning, we had this disconnect between uh, the, what the domain expert is describing and the table world. Um, and now let's look at, oh, this is, uh, there's an error here. Arrow. <laughs> you can, can't see that because the light is too bright, but there's an arrow. Um, so now we have Alice, uh, which is connected to the space shuttle by an edge. Uh, and this edge itself also has some attributes. We can pin uh, a post-it note to this edge and say, this edge is since 2003, uh, three, for example. And now we, have, we no longer have this disconnect anymore because this is very close to what the person draw, drew uh, in their um, domain uh, description. So if you want to implement uh, this kind of uh, modeling and this kind of uh, uh, way to explain to other people uh, uh, to work together with other people in your team or with your customers, then the first step is to explain graphs. And uh, I explain graphs to a lot of people, and it's extremely easy. Uh, explaining graphs uh, is even more easy if you have a piece of paper in front of you where you can draw on um, and draw edges and draw notes, and because it's very close to what people are having in their head anyways. So. Um, I don't know how, how, how many people uh, I explained it to, but nobody had a problem with understanding that. I tried the same thing with the entire tables thing, and people had a much harder time to wrap their head around it as soon as we have references between cells of the tables. But this is not a problem in the graph. Uh, so this is the first step when you talk to your domain expert. And then it's time to listen, so it's time to understand about your domain. You are not a domain expert. You have to learn about what is going on in this domain. What are the words we are using? What is a space shuttle? What is an astronaut? What is this uh, airplane carrying this uh, space shuttle? Uh, we need to understand those words. Uh, so we build up a vocabulary that is um, right in the domain uh, we are solving a problem in. And this is very useful because then you can also talk to the customers of, of, this, person, of this domain expert uh, because they are using this language as well. Um, and then uh, you, are, uh, you are working together to find a common language because now you, you are, have new words in your vocabulary and this, the other person has a new tool set of drawing graphs. Um, so now together you can model, uh, model a language. You can talk about you can de define uh, different words uh, that everyone understands in this team, and you can uh, then have documents that describe um, what, what you are talking about. And what this leads to is um, that you have one model that everyone involved understands. And this is extremely important in my opinion, because um, there's an excellent book, it's maybe one of my favorite technical books I've ever written, or it's not that technical maybe. Um, it's The Design of Everyday Things. Uh, it's a book about um, people giving this, uh, faulting their, themselves for doing certain mistakes when using devices, when using uh, showers, for example, where everything is messed up on. And he describes that if everyone in your team has the same model uh, in, in their head, then this will reflect on the people that are using your model as well. Because 
Uh, one problem that we have in a lot of products, uh, both in the software world and in the entire world, is that in your team you have not a, you don't have a consistent view on what your what your product is doing, what you, what language you are using to describe it. So uh, what what is um, reflected to the customer is a very uh, mixed picture. So you don't really know what the, uh, the the customer doesn't really understand because sometimes you're using this word and sometimes you're using that word to describe the same thing. So if everyone speaks the same language and uses the same words, then we will then the customer will learn this in, uh, the same language uh, in the same way. So everyone, including the customers, uses the same language, uh, which leads to a much better user experience. And then uh, you need to evolve uh, the model alongside the implementation because what I described right now that it sounds a lot of like waterfall, and um, then you have some design document uh, which is five years old and doesn't describe anything about your system but describes something entirely different. So this is extremely important. We have to evolve our model because otherwise um, this entire model is useless. Um, but we now have the tools that everyone in the team can evolve the model. We we uh, have the program that says. Okay, um, I know there is some error in here. Uh, this doesn't work like that. We have to adapt our model. But we also have the domain expert who says, okay, uh, this do doesn't work like that. Our customers need something different. We need to evolve the model as well. And then the implementation has to adapt. So those two evolve alongside each other. So uh, this is quite, uh, basically the recipe. So first, explain graphs, learn about the domain, find the common language, build one model for everyone involved, and then evolve the model alongside the implementation. Uh, and if you do that, I think um, you will, uh, it will result in a better product. Um, and we tried that with uh, different customers, and it worked really well. So uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, this is my GitHub handle and my uh, Twitter handle. And if you want to try out a database that does those multi-model things, then check out our AngoDB. Um, we have a lot of time for questions, so thank you for listening first, and then we have to take some questions. Yes. I wanted to ask about the performance of uh, this uh, type of database. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you asked about the, uh, the, the performance of this kind of database. I should I have to re repeat it for the camera. Okay, so um, this is a very general question <laughs> because there are different databases that implement this. Um, I don't see any downsides in performance uh, in this area. Uh, if we compare a RangoDB uh, to a, um, a pure document store like MongoDB, there is no big performance difference. So I don't think there is inherent in this kind of modeling that there is a big difference. Or maybe I understood your question wrong. Do you mean in the modeling or in the database? Uh, I mean in the database. In the database. Okay, so I, I think there is not a performance difference, no. I, I, in my experience, it is not a problem. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, so the, the question was, when we have uh, value objects that are embedded in different kinds of objects, then uh, we have repetition, basically. That's, that's your question, because you have to re-implement UI or uh, maybe something in your uh, API um, because you are using it in different places, right? Uh, I don't think that is a problem, because what, what, uh, in, what you do in uh, your code world is um, you have some uh, value object class for your address, and this is used by the, the different um, by the different uh, address kinds. Uh, so, we have, let, let's say we have um, 
what, where could you store the addresses? In persons and in, in buildings. OK, so uh, you have uh, those two. And then you have your uh, um, address class. And then in your program, you have to have a mapper, which uh, when it reads the data out of, out of your database, it maps the embedded addresses into uh, address, mod uh, address um, instances. And then you can have, uh, you basically can reuse all your code. So in, I have not found a problem with that approach. Uh, the address can be a resource. Um, so the question was about REST. Um, and if it is a resource, uh, I think uh, an, a value object can still be a resource. Uh, it, it is addressable still. Um, so I think it is still a resource. If you say you have a person, then uh, from the REST perspective, the uh, address is a sub-resource of the person. So you can address that, uh, and uh, you, can, you can identify it. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, okay. And that is not a problem. Um, you can have a different ad uh, different uh, URIs pointing to the same representation, because the even though the value objects are the same, you can uh, copy them as many times as you want. So maybe it's I don't understand the question entirely. Yeah, maybe okay, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe uh, so. We, maybe we can talk later about that in detail. Yes. <clears throat> maybe to add to the thing, I think if you're if you're thinking of your UI in terms of managing addresses, mm -hmm. then maybe you're still too much in the like normalized yeah. SQL mindset. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yes. How much effort is it um, to react curve for the domain code? Uh huh. So, like, uh, going back to addresses, um, some administrators need to decide how the zip codes are not four numbers, but five numbers. Uh huh. Yeah, I think we can't. Uh, okay, sorry, I always forget to repeat the question. So, what if, what if um, the domain expert changes um, things um, about uh, the problem, like changing the zip code from four digits to five digits, uh, and the, the database administrator says, "Ah, what is happening? Because I need to um, adjust the things now, right?" Okay, so. Hmm? Yeah, so um, this this can still be an effort, right? But I I think we we can't escape that. Um, we will have this kind th those kinds of problems uh, in each case if we are doing domain driven design or if we don't do it, or maybe I'm misunderstanding that because it could change uh, if this person is doing uh, is talking in the domain and it, it could also change if the person is not talking in the domain, right? So um, I think that um, because when we are talking in the same language, then we can communicate um, much easier about those kinds of issues. Because if the person says, for me, a postal code is always five digits, then this is now part of your domain description, right? Uh, and if, if, something, if this changes for some reason, then everyone understands that this needs to change something else in the system. Ah, okay. Okay, okay, now I understand. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, um, uh, if you are embedding things, then this is, of course, a higher effort. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, how much more depends on how big your project is. <laughs> so, yeah, but it, it's a bigger effort. I agree, yes. Okay. Thank you so much for listening and have a nice day.